Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming out on Father's Day. Uh, like Bob said, my name is Truman Atkins. I was born here in Martinsville, grew up here, um, lived my whole life uh, here, except when I was off at college. I was interested in history from an early age. I think I can remember in the first grade wondering about how we got from gun smoke to here <laughs> and all that. Uh, that fascinated me. When I was uh, 13 years old, I got bit by the genealogy bug, which made for a uh, very unusual adolescence. I spent a lot of time downstairs here at the courthouse in the old deed room looking up the deeds and the wills and inventories of various ancestors and, and putting it all together. Um, when I came home from um, college in 1987, I found work with my cousin, the late Steve Adkins, uh, who taught me how to do uh, title searches on uh, real estate, which I immediately kind of equated to like doing genealogy on land. It's like finding out, well, who owned it before then, who owned it before then, and what had they done to it, and, uh, and the like. So I really took to that. Um, it also, um, uh, led me to uh, become involved with uh, some of the other aspects like ordering surveys of property when property was changing hands. Survey would have to go out and make a new plat of it. And let's see, do this. That led me to J.A. Gustin and Associates, which was the company we used. They're no longer in business. Their sign is still on the door over here uh, at the end of Walnut Street on Church Street. And I have always had a fascination about these old buildings uptown. What was upstairs in them? What was inside of them? And one day I decided that I was going to take the opportunity to find out, instead of calling Gustin's office on the phone, I would go over in person and order a survey. And so I went up those stairs and I went down that dusty hallway past Irving Cubine's old law office and I went around the corner to Gustin's office and I opened the door and was met by the smiling face of this lady, Nancy Compton. How many remember Nancy Compton? Oh yes, uh-huh. She was, she was a doll. She was just put together like this every day to go to work in an office where she saw the same four or five guys hair maintained by Sherman Witt. She knew it all. She had a desk piled high with papers that must have gone back to Eisenhower's time. And she was just a delight. And she introduced me to Judd Gustin, who unfortunately can't find a picture of. And then one day I, I stopped by to order a survey. And this is Lane sprawled out along her desk next to her smoldering ashtray. And it is a plat uh, for developers diversified of the new mall that was being built. Um, this is one of the versions of it. And I was looking at it. I was fascinated by it. And then I saw this little thing right here. There's this little line across it. And it said, Jack Fountain's Spring Branch. And I was like, Nancy, what is this? And she said, yeah, there's a creek that goes under the mall. And it went under the fairgrounds beforehand. And I was, I was just floored that such a thing could be possible. So, you know, I filed that away for 35 years or so. And I uh, didn't, didn't really think much about it. I'd go by the mall sometimes thinking, oh, I'm crossing that creek. It's way underground. So, back in... So back in January, 
I was asked to do a program by Bob Tuggle for the uh, uh, society here, and we thought we'd do a genealogy. I said, well, that's more like a, what would you call it, a workshop type situation. And I said, but you know, there's this creek that runs under the mall. I could do a, a story on that. I'll have to research it and find out. So starting in January, that's what I started doing. And the first thing I found out that it is not Jack Fountain Spring Branch, it is Jack Fontaine's Spring Branch. Things get a little mixed up over time, different spellings. Fountain and Fontaine actually mean the same thing, which, which is spring in French. So Here is a um, topo map. Everybody knows what a topo map is. It shows the elevations. This one is from 99 years ago. And this is a pretty blurry detail. And let's see, right, right there. That's Courthouse Square. That's where we're at right now. And this is Jack Fontaine's Spring Ranch going down the hill, down through a holler to Jones's Creek. There's the walking trail now, and it was a railroad. Uh, this is a drop of about 325 feet from uh, the five-way intersection back here to the creek. And this is what it looks like today. Here's the uh, courthouse square. We've got the mall. We've got Commonwealth going through. And we've got Jones's Creek down here. And the walking trail now. So you can tell in 99 years it's really changed a lot. I'm gonna do something with this. Here, we'll try it this way. Jack Fontaine Spring, I believe this is it. And uh, it is a hole in the ground next to North Mall Street. Uh, where they have let the trees grow up because they couldn't get in to mow it. It's uh, a lot of fill dirt there. Don't know if the spring is still active. It uh, goes across the way under the uh, Walgreens and then across over to the mall. The genealogy of this land that it passes through, uh, it was originally part of the grant that Robert Harston had that he bequeathed his son George Harston. In 1791. In 1827, George Harston bequeathed it to two of his sons, Marshall Harston and George II, known as Old Rusty. And this is Old Rusty here. I couldn't find an image of Marshall, but the, uh, Old Rusty uh, built Hornsville Plantation in Stanley Town. In 1832, uh, George and Marshall sold it to Abel Nichols of Bedford County and George Brown of Henry County, 52 and a half of those acres for $362.50. In 1838, they sold uh, 33 acres to three individuals for $2,064. These three individuals were William J. Hamlet, Jesse Wooten, and Walter R. Cole. Now, William Hamlet was a teacher, and there was, in the, the deed, described, describing it as there being an academy on the property, and there was, the springs were academy springs. The uh, creek was academy creek. Um, so I'm thinking that Hamlet was probably the instructor there. Jesse Wooten was a deputy sheriff of Henry County. He later became the sheriff. Walter Cole was a local businessman, and they were trading as William J. Hamlet and Company merchants. Okay. Now, on the property also was a forge. It was, already, it was mentioned in the deed. It was already there. They needed somebody to run the forge to make some money. Thank you. And that. What am I doing here? Uh, what's it doing? <laughs> The 
it's um, acting as if it has a good battery. Let me turn them a little bit. Okay, Walter Cole had a brother-in-law, and he owned a blacksmith. The brother-in-law's name was Patrick Henry Fontaine, and the blacksmith's name was Jack. So, next slide, please. Okay, Walter Cole, let's see, let's go one more. Let's go one more. There's the forge, okay. This is the forge that is located at Red Hill, uh, Patrick Henry's estate, and I'm thinking it's probably similar to what was there. If we go to the next one, okay. We don't have a picture of Jack Fontaine. We do have his mark. Uh, this was made on a promissory note in 1883. So who was Jack Fontaine? He was born somewhere between 1820 and 1825 on Leatherwood Plantation. He was an enslaved person. His father's name began with the letter H. That's all we know about him. His mother was Millie Perkins, and she was a cook to the Fontaine family. They lived on uh, Leatherwood Plantation, which is now pretty much Eastwood subdivision. Um, it was land inherited uh, from William Winston Fontaine's grandfather, Patrick Henry. Uh, he had died in 1816 and left um, everything to his wife. Go to the next one, please. This is his widow, or uh, one source on the internet says it is. This is Martha Hale Dandridge Fontaine, and she was uh, the first cousin of Martha Washington. Um, she was widowed for about 14 years and with three children, and then about 1830, she decided she was going to remarry. Next slide, please. To do that, she had to settle her first husband's estate, and that is a uh, Done here in Henry County Circuit Court, Rule Book Number Three, Page Two Ninety One. You'll see at the bottom here where they divided up all the land between her, her two sons Spotswood and Patrick Henry, and her daughter Sarah. At the top, you will see how they divided up the slaves. The first column is Martha Hales, and on it you will see Millie's name. Millie remained with. Uh, Ms. Fontaine, and over here, you'll see Jack. Now, Jack was probably somewhere between five and ten years old at the time. The following year, um, Patrick Henry Fontaine began hiring him out. Uh, the family all moved to Martinsville. They sort of got out of farming, and um, he derived a certain amount of living uh, by hiring his slaves out and reaping the benefits of their labor. Next slide, please. Okay, a uh, well, chronology here. Martha Hale Dandridge marries William Perkins, Jr., and they moved to Main Street in Martinsville. They lived in a little house that's about where the Charles Kazee Educational Fund is. Patrick Henry Fontaine, Jr., because he had an uncle with the same name, 
uh, Mary and Sarah Miller Cullen moves to Martinsville. They operate the Henry House, which was a tavern. Michael Thomason was a man who many, many years later uh, testified that he could remember Jack Fontaine being in Martinsville when he was six years old, which was placed at about 1840. And in 1844, Patrick Henry Fontaine Jr. dies at the age of 32. His stepfather dies a few years later. Next, please. Sarah Cole Fontaine continues to hire Jack out. Uh, matter of fact, he stays hired out working at the Forge over here off North Wall Street. Uh, in 1848, on December 30th, she received $175 for his uh, hire ending that day for the year. Next slide, please. Jack had a family. Um, he had three sons and three daughters. Uh, Edward uh, cannot find a paper trail on him, don't know uh, much about him. Alan, who was the son of Lucy, Emily, who was the daughter of Charlotte, Taylor, who was the uh, son of Charlotte, Susan, who was the daughter of Lucy, and the youngest, Champ, who was the daughter of Lucy. In 1860, the war started. We all know which war this was. This is the bombing of Fort Sumter. Um, At this point, the land ownership had consolidated uh, solely uh, into Jesse Wooten's hands. Um, there's a sl slide, a few slides back. If we could go back to that, please. Yeah. Yeah, I keep going. There. Okay. 1844, the same year that Walter Cole conveyed his one-third interest to Jesse Wooten, that was the same year that his brother-in-law died, Jesse Wooten the following year conveyed his two-thirds interest to William Hamlet, and in 1849, Christopher Y. Thomas, trustee for Hamlet, conveyed the whole thing to Jesse Wooten for 30, the 33 acres. Uh, that was because there was a foreclosure involved. Uh, now the next slide, this is Christopher Y. Thomas, or C.Y. Thomas. You may have heard of him if you've ever done title work or familiar with the history. Uh, I believe that he was educated at this academy here in Martinsville. Um, he became a lawyer and a representative in Richmond, and he will figure prominently later on in the story. We could go to the next, please. Okay, we'll keep going. Yes. Uh, get there. One more. There we go. One more. Okay. So Jack and his family, they're living right over here. Uh, about where Liberty and North Moss come together. They are have a small house over there. Uh, they probably hear the shots from Stoneman's Raid in 1865, but the biggest thing that happens during the war for Jack Fontaine is that Jesse Wooten dies. And Jesse Wooten left behind a huge estate. He was owed a whole lot of money by a whole lot of people. He owned a lot of land. He had slaves as well. And Jack knew that it was, uh, he had been hired by Wooten for years, and he didn't know what was going to happen next, but it came the end of the war. Now, that was on one hand a good thing for him because there, he was emancipated, he became a citizen, he could vote, he could own property. And he knew that somebody could come in and buy that property that he had been living on for 25 years and working at to be the only thing he knew how to do, which was being a blacksmith. And so he resolved that he was going to buy it. Okay, next slide, please. Now, Jack was illiterate. He didn't know how to go about, go about doing things, but he had an ally, the much older now Christopher Y. Thomas. 
who had, during the war, been a representative in Richmond to the state government. He uh, had come back to town to start a business, and he said, we went to him, explained what he wanted to do. He had a friend with him named Sidney Perkins who wanted to go in with him to buy some of the land. And see why Thomas said, okay, I'll represent you. I'll, I'll go and talk to the executor of the state. That was a man named Jeremiah Griggs. So he goes and talks to Griggs. And go to the next slide, please. And he comes away with this. This is a contract, letter of intent, promissory note. Uh, I'll read it to you, 1865, October 28th, received from Jack Fontaine, freedman, by the hands of C.Y. Thomas, currency equal to $10 in specie. Anybody know what in specie means? It's by coin. He had a bunch of coins. In part payment for 13 and three-fourths acres of land adjoining the town of Martins, Virginia, and on which the blacksmith shop, now used by Jack, is situated, which I, this day, sold him and Sidney Perkins, which is crossed out, freed man, at the price of $30.15 per acre. That came to, I believe, $456 dollars for, for that total for those 13 and three quarters acres okay next slide please 1870 census here we have jack fontaine he's the census taker has left here from the courthouse gone down the hill and jack is the 11th house he comes to He's living there with his wife, Charlotte, his daughter, Susan and Champ, his mother, Millie Perkins, retired cook, and a man named Sam Stultz, who's a wagoner. He's boarding with them. This line here with the 500 is, that shows how much his personal property is worth, his tools. The little box next to it is uh, the value of his real estate. You'll see that it's sitting empty. That's because he's still paying for it. It was a very good thing how Griggs set this up. He didn't put a deadline on it. He didn't put an amount that had to be paid. It's like, you pay me what you can pay me, when you can pay me, and I'll deed it to you at the end of that. So in 1870, five years later, he's still struggling paying for this land. He gets up to 1872, and he finally gets it paid for, and Jeremiah Griggs dies and he dies without signing that deed. So, Jack Fontaine's like, what do we do now? This is what I'm imagining, anyway. And so, Thomas would have told him, don't worry, we'll wait until a new executor is appointed by the court. And we go next slide, please. The next executor of Jesse Williams' estate was this man, George W. Booker who had returned to Martinsville after uh, one source says not winning re-election or not running again. He had been our uh, representative in Congress from this area. He came back in 1872, set up a law practice, and he needed some cases, so the judge gave him Jesse Wooten's estate to settle. And see why Thomas, who's a friend of his, goes and knocks on his door, and he says, oh, we got this matter with Jack Fontaine, and take care of it and I don't know what I wasn't there I don't know what what the uh, outcome of the, the conversation was but he seems Booker seems to be less than forthcoming and we can tell that about what happens next uh, see why Thomas ends up representing Jack Fontaine in a lawsuit Jack Fontaine a free man brought suit against George W. Booker, former congressman uh, for specific performance. He, he wanted his land. The uh, case was heard possibly right here in, in front of the bench, possibly in the judges' chambers over here. 
But um, the result was the judge looked at all the evidence. He said, yes, you've done everything you're supposed to. And he issued an order to Booker saying, you must beat this to him. And next one, please. This is the result. Uh, Booker issued this deed. And it was dated the 10th of May, 1872. Uh, it contains a meets and bounds description that makes no sense whatsoever. It doesn't say how many acres it is. It's got some blanks in it, which is not uncommon for the time. But it's all he needed. It was put on record. Okay, next slide, please. This is um, what Martinsville looked like about that time. This is October 1874, and I've included this because this is this is C.Y. Thomas's law office. It's at the corner of Church and Bridge Street, where the beautiful orange and white building that's for sale now uh, is. Um, it was, there was a, uh, this was a hardware store next to it, and you can see there were advertising plows. And well, you know who, who makes plows? White Smiths do. Next one, please. Um, Jack Fontaine's uh, financial situation never really improves in life. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, it's, it's beginning to be like the last four or five years of his life, he starts to sell off most of his land, uh, beginning to Tarleton Brown, who's the ancestor of Reeves Brown. Um, who built a tobacco warehouse. Uh, the Joneses bought a lot of land from him um, in speculation. Uh, he sold some to members of his own community um, that were sometimes identified as colored in the deeds. Next, please. Um, he sold one section over here to uh, 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 Edward Towns, it became Town Street, and then another section which becomes Towns Avenue over here. Of course, Town Street is no longer there. It's the parking lot for the clock tower. Uh, Frank Prunty, uh, he sold a small lot to for $45. He gave a, a small lot to his son, Alan, that had a two-room house on it where Alan lived the rest of his life. And continue, please. Uh, he gave his home to uh, Champ Red, his daughter, in exchange for her taking care of him in his old age. Uh, he gave his daughter Emily Gravely uh, a lot. He gave his daughter Susan Wade a lot. The other two children are, were living away from here, so uh, they didn't get anything. Uh, he made his last conveyance uh, to Green Pen in 1886, and at the time of his death, which occurred 137 years ago today, on June the 18th, 1886, the only thing he owned was his blacksmith shop. Okay, um, two more things about Jack Fontaine before we move on. Next slide, please. Uh, this is what uh, Franklin Street looked like back then. Uh, this was in 1889. Um, this whole side of the street over here on the left would be property that he had sold off over the years. Uh, across the street you had the depot and there was a lot of tobacco warehouses and tobacco manufacturing going on at that time. This uh, is a detail from a map of Martinsville uh, in 1891. And I had seen this several times before, but not until I started researching it, did I notice, and this is, this is the area that we were talking about where he lived. Right up there is, is Fontaine Street. And that just amazed me that a, an African-American man would have a street named after him in the 1890s in Martinsville, and, and, and it makes me kind of proud. It, that's now completely buried by uh, uh, Commonwealth Boulevard, but you can see the, the branch going off down the holler there. Okay. And this last plaid, uh, this is showing Towns Avenue, George Street, those streets are still there, that configuration. 
Uh, about where you see his name written up there is where um, Walgreens is now. This is why I'm thinking it has retained the name Jack Fontaine's Spring Branch and not Academy Branch. Academy was just something that was written down. It was in a deed. You didn't see it and process it like you do something visual here. Uh, and this was from 1905. This was 19 years after he died, and it was uh, it had made its mark by then. The next chapter in the branch and the one who buried it, basically, uh, this is Captain Till Lester, George Tilden Lester, who came to Martinsville in 1896 uh, and began buying up property in the area. He um, had a uh, sawmill down on Jones Creek that in 1919 caught on fire and burned up. Next, please. Um, to a sway, to uh, ensure that that didn't happen again, he built a giant reservoir on top of the mountain above his plant. And he was approached by a local Kiwanis club that wanted there to be a swimming pool for the area children. And they came up with this. This is the Liberty Heights pool, um, which stood until about 1988. It was a 2,000 gallon circular pool. It had three uh, concentric rings in it. One was 18 inches, one was four feet deep, and the innermost was 12 feet deep. It had a diving platform. Uh, the water was changed every six or eight hours. It had a dancing pavilion. You could go roller skating on the top there until the, well, the wind took up the roof off. Uh, this was completed and opened, I believe, on the 4th of July, 1926. Um, this is the iconic image of, of all the kids just having a big time at Jack Fontaine's uh, Creek, which they're, they're suspended above it uh, several hundred feet, okay. Next, please. Now, Captain Till had a son, G.T. Lester, who uh, learned how to fly. He went to Danville and to a primitive airport there and took lessons and got his pilot's license. And he went to Cincinnati on a train and bought this Aronica KCL. It was the it was the Cadillac of that car, that type plane. It was, uh, it had an altimeter, it had a gas gauge, it had brakes on the wheels when you landed. And he bought the plane, they asked him how he was going to get it home. He said, well, you see, I came up here on the train, the train track's right over there, I'm just going to follow the train track home. And that's what he did. He took off and he followed the train track through West Virginia and Southwest Virginia, and, and, and he landed in Martinsville. And he went to Captain Till. He said, Dad, we need, it. We need an airfield. We, we really do. We can put it up on top of, of the mountain there. And so that's what happened to one side of the holler. It all got leveled out using two steam shovels and two dump trucks over um, uh, several months, and they created the airport. Next, please. Okay, here's a shot showing the pool right there and the airport going right next to that's the runway. Uh, Mr. Shotland, who had the glass company, later became Virginia Mirror, had a whole bunch of broken glass and he uh, needed a place to dump it, so they let him dump it out here at the end of the runway. And Morton Lester has told me that, you know, if you were flying into Martinsville, you'd and we're looking for the runway, that glass would glint for miles away and you could find your way in. The um, uh, uh, runway itself was dirt, but you know, just think about, you know, you're here in court, you're arguing a case or something, and like there's a plane coming in, like right over here. Just, it's, it's kind of like San Diego, if you've ever flown into there, just right over the tops of those buildings. Um, you will see over there the other side of the um, uh, 
taller that was still intact at the time. Those groups of houses up there, that's 80 Avenue. Right about, right about there is where Dollar Tree is. Now the effect of leveling this off impounded uh, Jack Fontaine Spring Branch somewhat, and I understand that it created a swimming hole and it was used by the African-American children in Martinsville um, in the 40s and 50s. Um, next, next slide, please. Uh, one historic thing that happened there at the airfield, this is Morton Lester, age 10, and uh, he uh, began flying with his dad at a very early age, and he began pestering him when he was about seven to let him uh, solo. And finally, one day, uh, when he was 10, his father let him go up by himself. And he flew the plane by himself, landed, no problem, got on his bike and went home. And uh, he was the youngest person on earth to have soloed in a plane for a long time. I'm sure that record's been broken. Okay, this fellow, the smiley fellow in the middle here, this is Cedric, and his name is, is really Harold Saunders, but they call him Cedric. And he had come here from um, Winston-Salem, was living with his aunt and uncle on North Mall Street, and G.T. Lester would see him around the, the airport sometimes, just checking the planes out, and he offered to teach him to fly. So he learned how to fly. He became a pilot in World War II and went on to become one of the uh, founding executives of Piedmont Airlines. Now, tragedy also struck uh, 79 years ago yesterday. Um, Lieutenant Claybrook Lester, who was a um, nephew of G.T. Lester, uh, was at the pool when he saw a plane come in and land that uh, was being piloted by uh, Ensign Steve Mitchell, who was from Martinsville, and another Martinsville native named Alan Swindler. I was told Alan Swindler worked at a local bank as a um, Comptroller, or whatever, he had to count the money and sign off on it at the end of the day, and he would always sign it a swindler. Um, but they landed, and um, Clayburg Lester took off from the pool to go over and see that plane. He knew that it was from o at the Ocala Air Force Base. He got over there. His uncle was already sitting in the cockpit with Steve Mitchell. They were going to take off, but he said, no. I'll, I'll fly next. You go ahead and, and go up with him. And because his dad was playing golf over at Forest Park and they wanted to go buzz him and tell him later that that was us. So they took off, they uh, made their flight, they came back up Fayette Street, they banked 90 degrees and stalled. And they crashed about at the location of the springs over here near the school bus garage. Um, Newspaper accounts indicate that one of them did actually survive the crash, but they were both lost in the fire. And it was a very sad time indeed. That was on a Saturday, and they were buried on Monday, uh, and all the stores in town closed for their funeral. Next one, please. Now I get to talk a bit about my family's involvement with the airport. This is my uncle, Marin. Jenny Price of Columbia, South Carolina. I like to say that's who I get my good looks from. Um, he was a photographer and pilot, and uh, he got word one day that his mother was in the hospital in Martinsville, and he decided that he would fly up and see her. So he called up my mother on the long distance line, and he said, Margaret, I'm gonna be at the Leicester Airport at such, about such and such time, can you come pick me up? She said she would, so she and my sister Elva went over there, and they picked him up. They went to the hospital, visited with Granny an hour or two, and then they came back, and he said, Margaret, I'm going to need some help uh, starting my plane. I need for you to get up in the cockpit when I tell you to turn this switch, and I'm going to spin the propeller. And she was terrified. She, she thought that plane was going to take off with her in it. And, and he finally said, no, look, I got the wheel scotched. It's not going anywhere. And so she climbed up in there, 
get with his sanity, crank, and she slid out of that, and she did not get on a plane again for another 40 years. <laughs> and he flew on home. Okay. There was also the Henry County Fair, uh, which um, was always a highlight of my uh, adolescence. Uh, we had the, um, but before I get to that, I have to uh, speak about the demise of the pool that closed in the 1950s because it became too much to maintain and there were other pools opening up in the area. Uh, and then in the early 60s, Commonwealth Boulevard came through and it cut up the runway in half, so they had to relocate the airport out to Spencer where it currently is. Uh, the last plane that supposedly landed there was in 1973. Um, um, Pat Sutton landed his plane there. And I don't know if he got it. He must have took off again, from, but he was the last person to use it. The fair would come around every September, and it was, for a kid, it was uh, sort of like your consolation prize for having to go back to school. So you knew at the, at the end of a one Friday, your teacher would open that drawer and pull out that envelope with those passes of the fair in it, and every school kid would get a pass. And their parents wouldn't, their younger siblings wouldn't, and you know, you could get in the fair, you still had to buy tickets to ride things. But the, 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 um, the uh, exchange club put on a great show. They had all the, all the, the classics. They had the uh, Tilt-A-Whirl, they had the, the Bullet, I never really ride that, the, the Scrambler, uh, you know, Ring the Bell thing. Uh, I still have my spin art that I did in 1975. <laughs> have it up on my kitchen wall. Um, and, but my favorite was the Ferris wheel because Depending how they had it set up that year, if it was facing towards the pool, you could go up and you could look over into the pool. And you could get a peek inside it there. Um, and then if it was facing the other way, well, then you still had the uh, 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 credible view. I like to go up at night when it was a whole lot cooler up there and, and sometimes bats would be flying around. and. Uh, you could see all the lights and the cars on the road, and next to the place. And then, after I got to be a certain age, came the time that everybody in Martinsville, I think, did it one time or another. They trespassed into the pool because it was just like it had been there all of my life, and I had never been in it. And so I snuck in one day, and I got to see rows and rows and rows and concentric rows of toilets and lockers everywhere all around the building it was it was an amazing thing an amazing ruin to visit uh, back when it was open it cost adults i think 50 cents to, to go inside Next one. now uh towards the end of the uh pool's life and this was like right before it was torn down a um, friend of mine uh, who got permission to go in um, took uh, some people up there. This is on Easter Sunday, 1987, and they encountered this man. And I was, I saw this picture probably 30 years ago uh, and was amazed to, to, to see this man's likeness again. This is Raleigh Moore. Raleigh Moore was a homeless man, and he lived in Martinsville. He uh, was an associate of Ellen Sue Lockhart, and they, um, I would see him a long brown overcoat uh, in the wintertime. He would be coming up um, Franklin Street over here, and Stringy Carter would run out with a styrofoam container with his dinner in it, and she would gush over him like he was one of her baby dolls. And um, he, I never spoke to him, he, uh, but he lived on the streets. He died in a house fire with two other men in 1987. And about a month later, after the newspaper article about that, it, there was another article that came out that he had tens of thousands of dollars in the bank that he would not touch because he was leaving it for his children. And then one day, uh, after the mall got built, 
the TV personality Willard Scott came and did a did the weather live on the Today Show at the mall's opening. And I watched it on TV from uh, about a mile away. And I'm looking at, at this picture now, and I've looked at it recently. I'm, I am almost certain I know who some of these women are, but I'm not, I'm not gonna say. And, um, and in fact, I think one of them might be here in the audience today, I'm not sure. <laughs> But Willard Scott did the opening, um, and I remember him go, uh, going out to um, commercial break and seeing uh, Pearly Reynolds and the Patrick Henry Travelers uh, doing their dance. And um, there's the next one, please. So that takes us up to the present time. Um, if you're looking for Jack Fontaine's branch today, well, you can go to the, this place here next to North Mall Street. You can see it there. And there is one other section of it that is still visible if you go down, uh, the next slide please, to the Dick and Willie Trail. And you uh, go from the um, Liberty Street Junction towards El Corral, you get to the half mile mark. You turn around, you go back the way you came, about 10 yards, and you go over to Jones's Creek. You will see this little bit of it coming out of the brush uh, into the uh, river. And I believe that's all I got. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Is there any questions? I'd just like to add a couple of things. Please. To what you're talking about. You're talking about the fair being on there. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the Finals Bazaar used to be on Brown Street Field before they built Market Street. Yes, right. They moved over there to the fairground area for like three or four years, let's say. I don't remember exactly. But they just never made a go of it like it was at Brown Street because then Brown Street Ball Field was, was the center part of the town for. A lot of activities being near the old high school. You could park all around over there. People worked in American towns, whatever. Uh, also, some of you may remember some of the airport. I do as a child because my father was a carpenter and he would go to the left the lumber company all the time. And of course, I was a little boy riding along in his truck. And I can remember one of the airport hangers being located at five where Starbucks and Jersey Mike's is mm -hmm. now. Yeah. And looking at that as a child, I thought, well, that's sure not a very good place to put an airplane. It looks like it's about ready to fall down. <laughs> it's just an old wood building, you know, just a roof, basically. Uh -huh. And then another thing, the airport, after, I guess if I'm saying it right here, when the airport was done away with over here, they actually moved over to the speedway. That's right. And had the one runway over there where the uh, industrial park is now back there where the aquatic fish hatchery is, I believe, or okay. something to that effect. Uh, something to do with fish, you haul out by the tank truck. Uh, and that general area was where there was one runway. Mm -hmm. And then quickly I grew itself and went to Spencer. But there are some memories, again, being a child that I go with my dad, and I guess I stood out there when he gets the lumber and stuff. Mm -hmm. Look across, and then there's the old Liberty Heights swimming pool, which I was like a lot of in that area when I got a little older. Had to go over there and go weak sides. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, uh, can I, can I see a show of hands of all the people have trespassed in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember the gentleman there you had in your program there, and he, of course, know who he was. Uh -huh. I remember him and several other people hanging around there all the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was just a lot of growth and it run down and everything. But it was a place to just go and look at you. You just want to stay there because you didn't know who was going to be around the next corner being a child. That's right. By then, I was probably 13, 14, something like that. And, uh, again, I just thought I mentioned those extra things that might bring back a few memories, especially the time of the bazaar, yeah. which was a big hit in town for many, many years. Okay. Well, thank you all very much, and, and this will negate all negative ramifications. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>